We'd like to give you an opportunity to worship God this morning with your finances by giving back a portion of what God has entrusted to you. Tithing is an act of worship, and as followers of Jesus, tithing is an act of worship that we are called to do. Tithes allow us, as a church, to reach out and connect people to Jesus. So to give this morning, you can go and visit thegatheringottawa.com giving. Thank you for giving. Hello everyone, welcome to The Gathering Online. We exist to connect people to the love of Jesus and we're glad that you are a part of our online church family. Now, if you are thinking about joining in person anytime soon, let me tell you, next week is the week to do it because we are having a church family potluck. Bring a dish to share, plug in that slow cooker, toss up that salad, bake those cookies and come join with your church family, maybe even meet them for the first time, spend some time connecting over food, that's my jam, and I hope it's yours too. That's this coming Sunday, October 30th, after church at St. FX High School. Now, the week following that, on November 6th, we're having a newcomer's lunch. If you are new to the gathering or even new-ish, we'd love to get to know you and we'd love to share more about our story as a church, our beliefs, that kind of thing. So join us, meet some of the board and staff. It's a great opportunity for anyone new and families and kids are welcome. I am going to ask you though to RSVP. So if you can reach out to me and let me know that you're interested, that would be super. You can either email me at info at thegatheringottawa.com or there was also a sign up button in your Gathering This Week email if you happen to subscribe to those. Lastly, I want to touch really quickly on the truck factor. Now this morning after in-person church, we had to load all of our gear into a rented U-Haul and then unload it into my garage that I theoretically cleaned up yesterday Clearly, I'm filming this before that happened. And we are doing this because we can't store our gear for in-person church at the school anymore. And we haven't been able to buy a truck yet. So my life has gotten incredibly complicated because it was already a walk in the park. <laughs> Anyways, here's the deal, folks. At the time of filming, we have reached $17,000. $350 for the truck fund, which is absolutely amazing. And we are so thrilled to be blessed by those who have donated. Thank you so, so much. That said, here's a fact. There are less truck options out there than we initially thought, and we are likely going to need to increase our truck budget. So if you had been considering donating to the truck fund, but then reconsidered when you heard we'd reached our goal, I would invite you to re-reconsider and help us reach a new goal of $20,000. And please, Lord, can we get a truck in the works? Because when the snow hits, my car wants to park in the garage. All right. Our lead pastor, Jeff, is here today with another message from our Acts of the Apostles sermon series, where we've been journeying through the book of Acts. And today, Jeff is looking at Acts 11. Who gets to be part of the church and who doesn't? Who is God's gospel message truly for? In Acts 11, we see the church realizing that since Jesus is for everyone, they need to be for everyone too. So what might this mean for us today? Well, you're about to find out. But first, let me read today's passage, which is Acts 11 verses 19 to 30. I am reading from the New Living Translation. The Church in Antioch of Syria. Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. When the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people 
It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. During this time, some prophets, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the Spirit that a great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius. So the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could. This they did, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this passage that we've just read. And I, I ask that you would just please remind us to, to be generous. That's what I just heard at the end of that passage right there. It was all about generosity. I pray that you would uh, work in our hearts to be generous as well. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together online and to worship you together. And I pray that you would open up our hearts to what it is that you are trying to say through Jeff this morning. Just prepare our hearts right now so that we are ready to receive what you have to give us. Thank you again for this time that we have to be together. And I pray a blessing upon all of our online church family. Whatever it is that they're going through right now, whatever they've got going on, whether it's happy stuff or sad stuff, whether it's hard stuff or easy stuff, I pray that you would just be present and that you would remind them that you are present and that they are not alone. They might physically feel alone right now, but truly they are not because you are there with them. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Have a great new week, everyone. I miss you. See you soon. chapter 11 or find them find that passage on you version there's notes available as well on you version for this morning's message if you want to track along that way we're continuing on in our series through the book of acts which is all about the story of the church and how the church first got started and what god's heart for the church is and how that can apply to us as a church today and we've covered a lot of ground so far as we journeyed through this book together. Believe it or not, we started this book working through it a year ago. Now we've taken lots of breaks and hopped in and out, but a year ago, last October, we started our journey through this important book. And if you were with us, you might remember that at the very beginning of the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, the whole story of the church started with just 120 very timid and worried people waiting in the upper room for the Holy Spirit to come. They didn't know the Holy Spirit was going to come. They didn't understand that, but waiting for God to do something. And then in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost happens. The Holy Spirit comes and some 3,000 people are added to the church that day. And then fast forward to Acts chapter 3 and 4 and you see another couple thousand people join the church as well, surrendering their lives to Jesus, becoming followers of Jesus and joining the church. It's this incredibly fast growing movement of God. And then throughout the book of Acts so far, we've seen a bunch of miracles as well, haven't we? As the Holy Spirit used Peter and John to heal that, that crippled beggar in Acts chapter 4, just outside the temple gate. And then in Acts chapter 9, Peter raised Lydia, or Dorcas, as she was known, from the dead. These are amazing stories, miracles of God's activity and work through the early church, stories that led to many people surrendering their lives to Jesus and becoming part of the church. Incredible stories. We've also seen a number of difficulties and challenges that this early church had to endure as well. Lots of persecution and violence. In Acts chapter 5, after Peter and John healed the crippled beggar outside of the temple gate, they were imprisoned. And violence broke out against the church. In Acts chapter 7, we saw Stephen being martyred. Christianity's first martyr being stoned to death and uh, persecution after that spread around the entire church and the church was scattered. Lots of challenges, persecution, violence against the church. We've also seen throughout Acts so far several conversions as well, right? Talked about the thousands of people that came to faith, but there's been some pretty interesting conversions as well, stories that are told in the book of Acts. For example, we've seen the Ethiopian eunuch, right, in Acts chapter 8 at the gospel then spread 
through to Africa, this Ethiopian man surrendered his life to Jesus. We saw Saul, or as we know him, Paul in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus, right? Who's this violent man who is on a mission to destroy the church and kill as many Christians as possible. And God intervened. Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. He surrendered his life to Jesus. And then last week, we had Cornelius, this Gentile man, this Roman officer, military officer, who, uh, was, who met Jesus because an angel appeared to him through a vision and then appeared to Peter and uh, all this crazy stuff happened. Peter met with this family, with Cornelius and his family, and they all surrendered their life to Jesus, breaking a racial barrier that existed up until this point. Again, we've, we've covered a lot of ground so far in this book. But with all the unique stories, there's really just one theme when you step back and think about it, one theme that exists throughout, and that is this. And it's that God is on the move by His Spirit through His people. That's what we're seeing in the book of Acts so far, that God is on the move by His Spirit through His people. Incredible stories of God moving through His church by the Holy Spirit. In this morning's passage, we really see more of the same. God continuing to move by His Spirit through His people as the church now reaches out not just to Jewish people as it had done a great job at so far, but now reaches out to non-Jewish people as well. Gentiles, as they're referred to in the Scripture, as the, the church, which was made up primarily of Jewish believers, as the church began to understand and realize that Jesus is for everybody and that everybody needs Jesus. Right? We talked about this last week. Jesus is for everybody, and everybody needs Jesus. The church is, is kind of figuring this out real time in this moment and realizing that, that God has a plan for the whole world, not just for the Jewish people. That like God wants to reach non-Jewish people, which I assume is most of us in the room. We're all Gentiles. Most of us are Gentiles, except for Noah in the back. He's not a Gentile. He's the only one here that God truly loves. But anyway, if you're not Jewish, this is our story. So Acts 11. If you've got your Bibles open, it starts off verses 1 through to 18, which was not read for us just a moment ago. So I'll summarize this part with you. It starts off with Peter back in Jerusalem meeting with the Jewish believers. In fact, in the ESV, different translation, they refer to this group of Jewish believers as the circumcision party. Doesn't really sound like much of a party to me. <laughs> Okay, but it's just like a, a group of Orthodox Jewish believers who are really strict about the Jewish law and the rules and so on. And they're meeting with Peter, and they're going like, what the heck are you doing? You just met with Cornelius, a Gentile? Like, that's forbidden. You're not supposed to have table fellowship with them. You're not supposed to enter their home and accept them into your life. What are you doing hanging out with Cornelius and his family? What the heck are you up to, Peter? What these circumcision party people were Wondering about. And so in verses 4 through to 18, Peter, in response to their criticisms and questions, he responds by telling them just exactly what happened in Acts 10. Tells them about Cornelius' vision, the angel that appeared to Cornelius. And then the angel, or the, the vision rather, that, that Peter had with the sheep and the animals, and don't call what I've called clean, unclean, and all of this. If you were with us last week, you remember the story, and he talks about how the Holy Spirit ultimately led Peter and his his friends, his crew, to Cornelius' house, and he went and met with them because he was being led by the Spirit. And as he did, as he preached, as he shared the gospel with them, the Holy Spirit came and filled them, Peter says, just as, they, just as the Holy Spirit filled us on the day of Pentecost as well. A very short summary of what Peter shared. And as Peter told them the story of what had happened in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius in his home, the most amazing thing happened to this circumcision party, these Jewish believers who were really concerned and had lots of questions about what on earth Peter was doing. They didn't get angry. They didn't argue with them. The, their lizard brains didn't get activated. You know, the, the amygdala didn't start firing in their head too much. They're like, what on earth are you doing? And we got to fight with Peter. we got to argue with him and correct him. They didn't do that. Instead, you know what they did? They celebrated God's work amongst the the Gentile people. They celebrated God's activity. Look at what we see here in verse 18, how they responded. When the others heard this, heard this report of the Holy Spirit coming upon the Gentile people, they stopped objecting and started uh, praising God instead. 
They said that we, ha- we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. It's an amazing response, isn't it? A, a mature, frankly, response by this group of Orthodox Jewish believers where they're able to put aside their own concerns and criticisms and questions. They would have had a whole bunch of theological questions about how all this was going to work. They were able to put that aside, and most importantly, they were able to put aside their own prejudices. Just remember, we talked about this last week, they, they hated the Gentile people. There was a racial divide here. These were not people who they thought should be included in God's kingdom in the church. They were able to put that aside and instead embrace this new thing that God was doing in that moment, understanding that the the gospel, the good news of Jesus, it wasn't just for them, but it was for people like the Gentiles as well, people who didn't look like them or believe like them or live like them. They were realizing, man, like, Jesus is for everybody. This message, this good news of Jesus, it's for everybody. And so they praised God and opened themselves to the new work that God was doing amongst the Gentiles. Which is something I think a lot of churches today struggle with, isn't it? Not with the Gentiles. We're kind of over that because we are mostly made up of Gentiles. But we struggle sometimes, I think, as churches to see past behavioral things or external criteria that we may impose on people in order to belong. We have a hard time seeing past certain things in order to accept them and include them in our lives and to uh, celebrate the good thing that God is doing in them. We struggle with this sometimes, I think, as a church. Remember seeing this and feeling this and frankly getting really frustrated by this many years ago when I worked with uh, an organization called Youth for Christ. I started out working with YFC. Some of you might know YFC. It's a youth evangelism organization that was started in part by Billy Graham several years ago, like in the 50s, and uh, started out in youth ministry with Youth for Christ, running a youth center in a rougher part of St. Catharines down in southern Ontario. We're in this really interesting neighborhood. We had the Health Angels Club just up the street from where we met. That was really fun, because sometimes they'd pop by and be like, hey, yo, if you ever need anything, let us know, right? Because they want us to like them. Uh, some, one time, someone broke into our, our, uh, the church that we rented from and stole all the sound equipment, and the Hell's Angels got wind of this. I didn't go to them, okay? I didn't tell them about this. And then all of a sudden, magically, all of our stuff reappeared. All of the church's stuff reappeared the next day, and this guy comes by, he's like, yo, did you, everything work out okay? Like, like, just tell me you didn't hurt anybody. Please tell me you didn't hurt anybody. That's the kind of ministry that we were engaged in. We had teenagers coming out to our youth center that were uh, really rough, from really kind of rough homes, broken homes. They're involved in gangs and drugs. Um, their language was rough. The music they listened to was rough. Again, unstable home environment. They're, they're, these were kids that wouldn't really typically fit, so to speak, in a normal church traditional church where everybody kind of dresses nice and looks the same. We wouldn't fit. But we would welcome them into our youth center and we would enter into their lives and walk with them. And every now and again, uh, we'd see uh, some of them come to faith in Christ and surrender their life to Jesus. And we begin to see the restoring, healing work of uh, the Spirit of God at work in them. And we, we would realize, man, like th- they need something more than, than we can offer here at this youth center. They need Christian community. They need to connect to a local church. And so I'd call my youth pa- pastor buddies in the city, and I'd say, we've got this group of five or ten youth that they are kind of rough, they're, they're new to faith and all that, but they need to connect in a church, but they connect with you. Can we partner to have these kids connect with your youth group in your church and so on? And every pastor would, of course, say, yes, we want to do this, for sure. And so we'd arrange rides and we'd sort it all out and get kids to these different churches. And sometimes it'd work out well. The church would welcome these kids in and and uh, accept them for who they are. But every now and again, more often than I'd like to say did happen, I'd get a call on the Monday morning after a Sunday or the Saturday morning after a Friday night youth group, and I'd hear from the youth pastor or a leader at the church, and they'd say, yeah, not going to really, I don't think it's going to work out with these kids. They're just, they're too rough. You know, they, they don't really fit in our culture. They dress we, like the kid was wearing a Marilyn Manson shirt, uh, heaven forbid, 
They, you know, would leave church every 20 minutes for a smoke. They would swear. They were, you know, interrupting stuff a little bit. It's just They don't really fit in our church. It's just it's too messy for us. Our church isn't ready for that. Parents are concerned these kids are going to be a bad influence on their kids, that sort of thing. And I remember getting those calls more often than I wish I had, just being so frustrated. But on one hand, kind of like, well, I like, I get it. These kids are a lot. It's hard. It takes a special church, special group of people to accept them. But, man, come on, church. Like, why why can't we just see past all the external stuff and the, the differences and the stuff that makes us uncomfortable and just see and celebrate the work of the Spirit in these kids' lives? Like, don't you see the journey that they're on and the story that they're coming from and how God is at work in this moment? Why can't we just love on them and accept them mess? And all, sometimes I say that, <laughs> something like that to the youth pastor, and they think, yeah, I know, I know, I know, but our church just isn't ready. Our church looks like it's not ready for the mess of welcoming in people who are different than us. But it's what we see this church in Acts 11 doing, as they committed, in a way, to becoming a church are shaped by the grace and mercy of Jesus, welcoming in these Gentiles, people who are of a different race, different ethnicity, different culture, different background, different religious beliefs, all of that, being a, a church that is shaped by grace and welcoming in these people who are very different from them. It's incredible. This moment, actually, in Acts 11, it's hard to overstate how significant and pivotal it was for the early church, the story of the church in the book of Acts. See, up until this moment, before Acts 10, Acts 11, the church was primarily about the work of ministering to Jewish people, welcoming in the Jews to the church, seeing Jewish people convert to Christianity and become part of the church. But moving forward through the rest of the book of Acts, which 28 chapters, so another 18 chapters, it's all about the Gentiles. Yes, we see more Jewish communities and people come to faith, which is awesome. They didn't stop evangelizing the Jewish people, but they really focused on reaching the Gentile people as well as they realized, right, John 3.16, that for God so loved the world, not just people like them, the world, every culture, every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so they committed to reaching people of different cultures and ethnicities and races. What we see in Acts 11 here in the rest of the chapter, actually we see this church in Acts committing to reaching more Gentile people, where after Peter explained himself and the Jewish believers showing a lot of maturity demonstrated uh, this joy and celebration of the new work of God in these people, we see the church then go into full-on missionary and church planter mode right away. Look at verse 19. Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death, which is what we read about in Acts 8, verse 1, where this great wave of persecution came over the church after Stephen's death in Acts chapter 7, and the believers scattered about through Judea and Samaria. These believers, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of Lord, but Luke, uh, the word of the Lord, the word of God, but Luke says, only though to the Jewish people, as had been the pattern up until that point, right? Reaching people like them. Growth primarily from within Judaism. Verse 20. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus to Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. They rebelled against the status quo without knowing that the status quo was about to change. Verse 21. The power of the Lord is with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Now, here's what I love about this part of the story. Not just the, that a bunch of Gentiles came to the Lord and whatever. That's awesome. That's fantastic. That's really the point of this passage. But, but I love how when we read this part of the story, we come to realize that while God was at work in Peter's life, in Cornelius' life, in the circumcision party's lives, kind of bringing them up to speed with what he was doing. He was also at work over here already amongst the Gentile people through this scattered church, bringing people to faith 
in Christ. He was already at work bringing Gentiles into the fold before the story of Cornelius, before the story of Peter, before the circumcision party meeting and all that kind of stuff. I want you to track with me. If I'm going to lose you, I'm going to lose you here. Here's, I think, the point that we see here. It gives us some insight, I think, into how God sometimes works in our lives and in our world. Because uh, I don't know about you. For, for me, I sometimes have tunnel vision, right? In my life, all I can see is what's in front of me, my own circumstances, my own problems, the, the challenges that I'm facing day to day, my own prayers. God, would you heal this person, save me from this situation, redeem that story, work in these ways. But God, in his sovereignty and divine plan, he doesn't have tunnel vision. He sees the whole story. He sees not just our problems and our circumstances. He sees everything going on in the world. And in his divine timing and sovereign plan, he works in the events of our lives and the events of others to kind of weave our story together so that his divine redemptive plan can be accomplished. Does that make sense? We only see what we can see, but God's at work doing something so much bigger and greater, somehow redeeming all of the, the world's problems and the, the challenges that we face in order for his redemptive plan to be accomplished, weaving our stories and details together. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans 8, verse 28, doesn't he? Which is that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love and trust God. We only see what we can see in front of us, but God sees the whole picture, and he's at work making it all fit together for his purposes and for our good. A small example of this from this past week that I was thinking about. There was a pastor, there is a pastor in the city who I didn't really know, who reached out randomly to me and said, Hey, we're both walking with um, this family who's going through some challenges. What if we get together and talk about it? How can we support this family best together? I'm like, okay, let's, I don't know this person. I had my guard up a little bit. Different theological stream. He's a little bit different than I am. I don't know if this is someone I'm going to really click with, but we'll work together for the sake of supporting this family. And we get together a couple times, and we're talking with the family. And last time we got together, all of a sudden realized, he starts telling me about how he just found his birth mom the week before. And then traveled out to see her and sit with her and found out he had a sister about my age. I'm like, interesting you say that. I was adopted, <laughs> and I found my birth mom 16 years ago, and I know everything that you're feeling right now, and let's talk about it, and we just turned into not talking about this other family, but about being friends one to another and journeying together through the stuff that's going on in his life as well as in my life and just being an encouragement to one another. We, we stepped back at the end of it, and we said, isn't it funny how we got together to talk about this issue, like tunnel vision, all we can see is this issue in front of us? But God, God knew that our path needed to cross. God knew that a friendship needed to be born here. God knew that this would be what we both needed in this moment, and he caused our path to cross. It just encourages us to say, like, even in the mess and brokenness of the circumstances of our life, God is always at work doing stuff. He's always at work in the mess of our lives. We just have to have eyes to see what he's up to, because he sees the bigger picture we don't. I, I hope that encourages you in some way this morning. Whatever it is that you're facing, you know, we've got tunnel vision, but God sees the bigger picture. He's at work in your story. Look for him. Look for the ways that he's at work. Well, we read on in verse 22. We see how the church now responds. as They realize that God's, you know, seeing, he's using this, these people to scatter church to see the gospel spread amongst the Gentiles and that churches are being birth in Antioch and places where lots of Gentile people live. Verse 22, we see how the church in Jerusalem responded. When the church in Jerusalem heard what had happened, that all these Gentiles were coming to faith in Christ, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Now, we've met, Antioch, or we've met Barnabas rather a couple times before in the book of Acts. Acts 4, verse 37, we're introduced first to Barnabas. He's selling his property and giving the proceeds of his property to the church to meet the needs of the poor in Acts 9. We see him vouching for Saul. We talked about Saul, as we know, as Paul, who was a, a persecutor of the church. He vouched for Paul before the apostles to say, like, no, like, actually, God's at work 
in this guy's story. This guy Barnabas, he's not an apostle, he's not one of the key leaders in the church as of yet, but he's a Jewish disciple and a leader in the church who's got a lot of influence. So the church in Jerusalem, they see that God's up to something amongst the Gentile people, and they're like, let's send Barnabas in. His name literally means encourager, so let's send him down to these new believers and have him encourage them in the faith. Barnabas is a good dude. Verse 23, when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. He was filled with joy, just like the Jewish believers earlier on in Acts chapter 11. didn't respond with prejudice, racism, as he might have been tempted to. Shock, but with joy. Verse 24. Barnabas was a good man, or a good dude, as I just said, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Many Gentile people came to faith in Christ through his ministry and the ministry of those Gentiles who are coming to faith in that area as renewal really broke out in the village of Antioch. In fact, it's, it's interesting, it's speculated that Luke, who wrote the book of Acts and the Gospel of Luke, that he was actually one of these converts at this point in the story. We don't know that for sure, but he's from Antioch. And you kind of read on throughout the book of Acts, he's sometimes just using us language, like he's part of the story now. It's cool. He came to faith, maybe, in this moment, in Acts 11. Verse 25. And then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, who we know as Paul, who had come to faith in dramatic fashion back in Acts chapter 9, as we talked about, the Damascus Road experience, and who Barnabas had vouched for before the apostles. Barnabas, ever the optimist, he's like, I'm going to go get that dude, Saul. I think that he's got something to offer these people when the rest of the church is probably like, we're not so sure about this guy, Paul. He still might want to kill us. We're not so sure about him. Barnabas is like, no, I'm going to go get him, and he's going to help me with these new believers in Antioch. Love Barnabas. We all need Barnabases in our life, right? Someone who sees the good and calls it out in our life. Verse 26. When Barnabas found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Listen, both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large, crowd, large crowds of people. I love that. Sometimes we gloss over that in these stories. Like, Paul and Barnabas gave up a whole year of their life to meet with these new believers, to disciple them to teach them the scriptures, to help them to understand. Because remember, these new Gentile believers, they had no context for any of this. They weren't Jewish. They didn't understand the story of the Messiah and how it all fits together. They needed people to come alongside them and show them how it all fits together. They needed people to come alongside them, to love on them, and disciple them and help them grow in the faith. Just as, by the way, you and I do as well. We need people in our lives to disciple us, to walk with us, to grow us. We can't grow in our faith alone. We tried through COVID, didn't we? How did that go? For most of us, not great. We're still feeling the effects of isolation. Online was nice. Not the same. We need the body of Christ. We need one another in our lives or we won't grow. Paul and Barnabas or it wasn't Paul, rather. Bar- yeah, sorry, it was Paul and Barnabas. They understood that here and stayed with them for a full year. I love that. And then look at the last line in verse 26, in parentheses. Luke says, it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Isn't that cool? So in this moment, in Acts 11, we first are introduced to this term Christians, which has become sometimes a not very positive word. Sometimes people don't like the word Christian. We don't really know what Christian means anymore. Oh, they're Christians. Slap on the word evangelical in front of it. People get even more angry. Capital E, evangelicals? Oh, my goodness. But as this movement grew, right, they, they needed a name. There's thousands of people who are coming to faith in Christ. And now it's not just Jewish people. So people weren't like, well, they're Jews who just believe in Jesus. Now it's Gentiles. They're like, oh, shoot, this thing is getting so big. We need to call it something. And so they called the movement, they called the believers of Jesus that were part of this movement, Christians. Which just means, quite simply, little Christs. Those who mimic Christ. Those who are committed to following in the way of Christ. Those who live for Christ. Again, the term today has become derogatory in some people's minds. But that's not how it was understood in the first century. Passage ends in verses 27 through to 30. We won't read it, but it ends with this great example of the Gentile church now being the church. 
to the Jewish church, the people who were once their enemies. Right? They hear about this famine that's coming, so they raise funds and they send those funds with Paul and Barnabas back to the Jewish church to provide relief, to help them. Cool to hear Stephen this morning talking about that and how we can do that as well by sending literally money, relief, through ministries like MCC to Christians and non-Christians around the world who just need to have the peace and hope and love of Jesus in practical ways. It's what this church started to do as they grew and were discipled in the faith. They're like, yeah, obviously, we're going to help others. We're going to give of ourselves to serve others in this way. So cool. Acts 11. And the story of God. God on the move now amongst the Gentile people as the Jewish church came to grips with the reality that Jesus actually is for everybody and that everybody needs Jesus. And that because Jesus is for everybody and everybody needs Jesus, everybody needs the church as well. We need the body of Christ to come alongside them because God's plan was always to include the Gentiles as part of the church. Now, that's 11th the story of the Gentile church. What does this all mean for us here today in the year 2022? Well, there's a number of potential applications that we could hone in on. We could talk about evangelism, right? And being the kind of people who actively look to share our faith, not in an aggressive, ram it down your throat kind of way, but just being open to the Spirit's lead to share about the hope and love and joy, peace, the good news of Jesus to people who desperately Need it. We could talk about things like church planting. Right? That's what's kind of happening here in Acts 11. New churches are sprouting up, and the church in Jerusalem is committing to planting churches throughout these Gentile nations. We could talk about how important it is that we be about the work of church planting. It's why we as the, as the church here in Ottawa are working with Dan Mead and Bytown Community Church and other churches like Southeast City Church. And I'm a part of the missional expression team in our denomination, which is about the work of church planting. It's because we know that if you can grow communities of believers in different neighborhoods and cities around our province and ultimately our country, they'll grow disciples, they'll help people come to faith, and so we want to be about the work of church planting. We could talk about Barnabas and the church's open response to people who were so different than them. Like Barnabas goes to this Gentile church and like, man, they don't, they don't look like me, they don't believe like me, they don't live like me, I don't really fit here. But he accepts them, and they accept him as well. We can talk about that. That's a great application. But if you think about this story, you distill all those things down. I think there's one singular core invitation coming out of this story for us to consider. One challenge, one invitation for us in our lives today, especially as a church together, and it's this. It's to be the kind of church and the kind of people who are for everybody. That's it. To be the kind of church and the kind of people who are for everybody, no matter who they are or what they've done or how different they may, may be from us. It's to become and to continue to become, as the church, a grace-shaped church. A grace-shaped people. An accepting church. Because if, if Jesus, like think about this, right? if Jesus is for everybody, and we believe that everybody needs Jesus, as we talked about last week, the implication then for us as a church and as a people is that we be for everybody too. Not just people like us, or who look like us, who live like us, who love like us, who uh, believe like us, but everybody recognizing God's uh, image in each and every individual, loving people exactly where they're at, so they, they too can experience the love and grace and mercy of Jesus. Which I know as I say that is so much easier said than done. I think theologically when I say that, well, like, yeah, that, that's right. We should be that kind of church. But it's, it's easier said than done, isn't it? It can be difficult and messy when we welcome and include and embrace people who are different than us. Think back to my story with those teenagers at Youth for Christ. All those churches wanted to be the kind of church, they said, who accepted and included these teenagers, but only so many could do it. A lot of churches weren't comfortable with the mess. A lot of, a lot of churches, they preach grace, but they don't live grace because it's just too hard 
and too messy, and so we settle for churches that, are, that include people that are just like us, that look like us, live like us, love like us. And we, because we don't agree with everything that's happening out there, we say we can't accept people, we can't include people. But here's, here's the thing about being a church of people that is for everybody that we just need to come to terms with. It's messy. It's messy. People's stories are messy. People's lives are messy. The decisions they make can be messy. There can be drama sometimes. This week, I'm not going to tell you about it, but my goodness, there were four or five different stories. There's drama. It became, just let me sleep. <laughs> Wake me up when it's over. The drama. But it's, that's what it is. When you embrace a life of grace and inclusion of others who are different than us, it's messy. It must be messy. You know, um, one of the things I love about our church is that I think that we're committed to being this kind of church. I, I do. I love that about our church. We accept people where they're at. We meet people where they are at. We committed to being, I think, a safe place for people to belong. You don't have to look like us, live like us, believe like us in order to be a part of us. Because we love you. God loves you. So we love you. Do we understand that Jesus is for everybody? So we want to be for everybody, too. But yesterday, we did a prayer walk. We did a prayer walk yesterday. A handful of us were walking around a different part of this neighborhood and we're noticing... Man, this just get this sense in our spirit that there's like a real sense of loneliness in our neighborhood. Like there's nobody out walking around. They're inside. It's a beautiful day. Nobody's outside. No kids playing on the street. In the new neighborhood where where uh, kind of south of Earl Armstrong, um, people may have moved in there throughout COVID. They haven't had a chance yet to get to know their neighbors. Think of it about the, the hurt and the isolation, the loneliness that people. Are facing. And then I was thinking about the neighborhood uh, study that Linda Cudmore's organization did for us. And I was thinking about all the different ethnicities represented in our neighborhood. And we saw that Mandarin is one of the most spoken languages in our neighborhood. I don't know if you knew that. French or English, French, Mandarin. I'm like, I don't know anybody who speaks Mandarin from our neighborhood. Literally nobody. It got me thinking about our church and how much more we can do to love on our neighborhood, those, those who are hurting, in need of community, in need of acceptance and inclusion, and to intentionally be kind of, kind of community that says, hey, we, we don't want to just be a bunch of white people or whatever, get together on Sundays. We want to see a, a multi-ethnic church. And if it's going to happen, it's going to take people like me, white privileged dudes, having a posture of listening and learning from others, that's going to take all of us together, being like, I want to learn, I want to understand, I want to see our church reflect God's heart for everybody. Our mission, we exist to connect people, all people, not just people like us, but all people to love of Jesus. How can we continue to do that better for people who are different than us? It's going to be messy, but God's in it. And he was in it in Acts, he's on the move the church, and he longs to continue to move through us today to commit to being that kind of church. So how is God calling you this week? And you are the church. It's not the organization, the institution of the church. You are the church, the people of God. So how can you, how can we, how can I commit this week to being someone who extends grace to someone who's different than me? Someone who looks different, lives different, believes different, loves differently than I do in ways I might not agree with. How can I live this out? These are the questions we need to wrestle with. We need to move forward together as a church. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, it's nice to talk about all this stuff. Um, out of the scriptures, it's nice to theorize about it, theologize about it, philosophize, philosophize about it. Um, but it's hard, it's messy leads to conversations that we're not always feeling prepared for, leads to dynamics that can be tricky. Uh, it's messy. And we thank you that your grace covers the mess. And you long for us to be the kind of people who aren't about, you know, just you know, judging people from, you know, the outside in, but the people who look at the heart as you do, who extend grace to one another and accept and include. Make us 
speak to those kinds of people with faith. A church that loves and accepts those who are different ways, just as the early church did. And yeah, there's, there's questions that get raised, and what about this, and what about that, and how does that work, and all of that, but that's part of the mess. We thank you that you are sovereign over that, that work in our lives, in our stories, to accomplish your redemptive purposes in our lives and in the world. Pray that you would remind us again of your grace for us. We know that the only way we can extend grace to others is if we're, we're really clear in understanding your grace for us, that we are broken, sinful people in need of your mercy and your grace, and you've given that to us in Jesus on the cross. And as we experience that grace, we'll be able to share it with others. Remind us again of your grace and your mercy so we can share it with others as well. In Jesus' name, amen. How great this love Oh, it's moving all my mountains This perfect love Is casting out my fear How great this love Welcomes me like family, and anywhere I go, it meets me there. And He is good, and He is God. And what I earned, it's not what I. My God is love. How great this love. Oh, it's faithful through my failures. This trusted love is with me till the end. How great this love. Oh, it's closer than a brother. This is love, He died so I could live, but He is good, and He is God, and what I earn, it's not what I My God is love. Say about him, my God is love.